It's interesting that the passage from Romans today also comes up in the church lectionary some years as a reading for the first Sunday in Advent, when the church is preparing to celebrate Christ both come into the world as a human baby and the anticipation of Christ's full reign on earth. Today, the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, we stand on the cusp not of a new church year, which begins with Advent in late November, but certainly on the edge of a new pastoral year. Also a launch into fall, into new activities and routines, but also within the context, as we know, of a changed world, one that we couldn't possibly have predicted a few months ago. And so the expectation that usually accompanies this time of year is perhaps more fraught with anxiety and worry and uncertainty than other Septembers in years past. So anticipation and anxiety, a context the early Christians also understood as they struggled through persecution to find identity and unity. Our text today is the end of a section in Paul's letter to the Romans and the end of our three-week theme series exploring Paul's encouragement of the Christian community in Rome as he talks about the way of love and how to live individually and communally following Jesus' teachings about love. Last week, as Paul laid out some instructions for how the followers of Jesus should live as the body of Christ, he starts with love. And here in the continuation of his letter, Paul circles back to love. Oh, no one anything, he writes, except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now we should remember that for Paul, the love Christians are called to embody is agape love, which we talked about last week, the deep, enduring, sacrificial love of God. And now Paul is making it very clear, love is all you need, to quote a famous paraphrase. Well, actually, Paul is quoting Jesus, who, when asked which is the greatest commandment, quotes the Jewish Torah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus had taught that these were the greatest commandments and were the lens through which all other laws and teachings should be understood. Then Paul goes one step further in insisting that because love does not wrong a neighbor, then love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul then takes a slight turn. And besides this, he writes, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Sounds a bit end times, but as we know, the world has been and is still going some 2,000 years after Paul wrote this. So what are we to make of the statement that the day is near and his admonition to wake from sleep? Well, I'm going to suggest that for now we hold those questions and look at one co what comes after first. In the next set of verses, Paul seems to want to help us understand what he means by waking from sleep. Thanks, Paul. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Now, I don't think Paul is suggesting here that these works of darkness only take place at night, so we need to always act how we would during the day only. Instead, I think he's using light and dark as metaphors, however we feel about that, as metaphors for things that are of Christ, 
who we know is spoken of in scripture as the light, particularly by gospel writer John, and things that are not of Christ, which to Paul's thinking means not grounded in love. As Paul goes on to talk about putting on Christ and making no provision for the flesh, one thinks back to his earlier writing about being the body of Christ and about not being conformed to this world, which he might describe as the things of the flesh. And so for Paul, what is the armor of light, if not the mind and heart and love of Christ? If we think back two weeks at a chapter earlier in this letter, recall Paul talks not only about not being conformed to this world, but about letting our minds be transformed. As we look at everything that Paul's been saying in these chapters, we might be tempted to title the whole section as transformative nonconformity. To be conformed to this world is to live for yourself, to treasure wealth and status, to act hypocritically, to follow the rules even when they go against love of neighbor. And turning away from these ways, resisting the so-called ways of the world is tough work. We need help and protection. We need to put on Christ, to put on the armor of light. An article appeared recently in Yes Magazine. I've added the link to our Facebook page and to the PDF version of this sermon. The article gives several examples of how since the pandemic began, people and organizations, even corporations and governments, have suddenly found ways to mobilize to support and sustain and help in critical ways, often in ways and certainly in a time frame which we actually never thought would be possible. It's as if suddenly the old rules don't matter, don't apply. Not when our very survival globally has been threatened in a way that we have not seen before. And we're not just talking about the pandemic because we know we have had pandemics in the past, but why and how the pandemic ended up being unleashed. And what that means for humanity's and the world's survival. If climate change and industrialization and overconsumption have brought us to this point, to the brink, perhaps we have begun to realize, the article suggests, that our priority is not more material production and consumption for its own sake, but life itself. That must be our priority. And from this realization, the unthinkable, it says, has not just become possible, but essential for survival. And what exactly is the unthinkable? Well, it's exactly the kind of transformative nonconformity that Paul has been talking about, and which we've already seen glimpses of in the mass comings together we've witnessed and hopefully been part of as humanity has been responding to the pandemic and beginning to understand its lessons. The unthinkable, what is it? A sense of communal solidarity as humans everywhere make radical changes to their way of living to protect the most vulnerable, this article would suggest. Also, fundamental transformation of industries such as the energy industry that are critical to our global economic activity. And my personal favorite, so quoting the article exactly here, is I love the way they put it. A radical reshaping of our frame of orientation from endless material growth to a new life-oriented system explicitly designed for the protection and flourishing of the human species and all living beings. We have seen glimmers of these former unthinkables, although I think I'd prefer to call them big ideas to live more fully into the reign of Christ. But as the article points out, we need more than glimmers. We need the determination now to step through the portal into a new paradigm. 
a new world where, as the article so eloquently puts it, our capacity to love each other has become integral to our survival, as if that has not always been the case. Love, agape, philia, love, love of neighbor as ourselves, as that which will save us, that will save us all. Only the way of love can enable us to step through that portal. As a church, we must affirm this. We must clothe ourselves with Christ and be willing to step through too, to take risks, to put love first, and really look at what that means for us and our life together as a community of Christ followers. Paul was so right. We need to wake from our spiritual sleep. For Christ, our light, our day, our sun is near. In the world and in us, leading us to a dawn that is growing brighter. I want to leave you with this poem, Blessing by Jan Richardson, titled, When We Breathe Together. Friends, this is the blessing we cannot speak by ourselves. This is the blessing we cannot summon by our own devices, cannot shape to our own purposes, cannot bend to our own will. This is the blessing that comes when we leave behind our aloneness, when we gather together, when we turn toward one another. This is the blessing that blazes among us when we dare to love, to put on Christ. When we finally listen into the chaos, when we breathe together at last, may it be so. Thanks be to God.